We want to continue our study in the Gospel of Matthew, and today we consider the final judgment and the second part of our series on Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Let me take you back some years to mid-December 1970. Two psychologists decide to test their hypothesis at Princeton Theological Seminary with the seminary students in an experiment which has become very infamous. It's known as the Good Samaritan Experiment. Forty students were called into an office and told they had to give a speech that very day across campus. Half the students were given a copy of the parable of the Good Samaritan and told they would be required to deliver a sermon on the subject in just a few minutes. The other half were told they would be talking extemporaneously, just off the cuff, about employment prospects for seminary students. Two totally different subjects. Within just a few minutes, both of them were going to have to share. On the way to the test site, each student would have to pass a, quote, poorly dressed, homeless-looking figure, slumped in a doorway, head down, eyes closed, not moving, a man described by the two psychologists as an ambiguous figure in need of help, probably drunk, possibly dangerous. Very similar situation to what the Good Samaritan found on the road to Jericho, except for the man there was naked. This guy did have clothing on, tattered clothes that they were. On the way to the test site, as each student went by, the results spoke much louder than their sermons did. 60% of the seminarians walked on past the gentleman laying there without offering any help at all. Only 10% of the ones in a rush stopped to ask for help. A seminarian thinking about the parable of the Good Samaritan was no more likely to stop and talk and help this man, or even offer help, than the person who was talking about seminary prospects and employment. Here's the reflective question for us today. How many of us are like those seminary students? How many of us are walking through this world, and we have opportunities that are not just traps put in front of us to test us, but are legitimate, real, authentic people who are hurting and needing help? How many of us don't even consider offering aid? What scares me even more about the study, now Princeton Seminary is not a Bible-believing seminary by any means, but what scares me even more is that the majority of the students, this man was slumped in a doorway, and the majority of them, without speaking to him, stepped over him to get into the classroom. Today we consider the second part of Matthew 25, 31-46. There are a few truths we talked about last week. Let me just quickly review before we jump into this. Number one, we saw last week in these verses, no one will escape the final judgment. You can run from justice on this earth. You can't do it when that final day comes. I could ask us to raise your hands if you've done something wrong in the past and you were never caught for it. And I know every one of us would raise our hands. In fact, last night we were sitting in the living room and a spotlight beamed through our living room window. And I looked at my wife and said, what did you do now? (laughs) Not really. I didn't really. But the light came in the window. They were looking for somebody. Someone was on the run. And the police had that thing and they were going in each yard looking. Because people are on the run from their sin. But it won't be the case on the last day. Today, people despise the gospel. They refuse to hear God's gracious invitations. It won't be that way on the last day. Secondly, we saw the judgment was warned of by Jesus because He is loving. There is not a loving Jesus and a judging Jesus. Yes, Jesus talks about hell. Yes, He talks about judgment. But the fact is, if you love someone, you don't want something bad to happen to them. And so you do everything in your power to warn them and protect them from the harm that is coming. So we saw there's not two different Jesuses, the the love Jesus and the judgment Jesus. They're one and the same. And then last time we also found that Jesus is the judge that will not be fooled. You can put a pretentious act on and fool most of the people most of the time here, but you can't fool Jesus Christ. He knows his sheep, they hear his voice, they follow him, unlike the goats who do not. So, with all that said, introduction, Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Let's hear God's word and we'll pray together. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, 
Then He will sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him will be gathered all the nations, all the peoples. He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then will the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Truly, verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brothers, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. I was naked, and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these shall go away into ever lasting punishment, or eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. God, help us today to hear your heart in this passage, to hear what you are saying to us. Oh God, we pray today as we consider this final judgment, these sober words, that we would not try to run, because we know we can only run so far. God, we would not try to avoid these hard truths that you are saying, because they are hard But they are loving. And God, we need to consider who you are and what you're saying to each one of us today. Help us now. And we will give you praise for what you do in our lives. In Jesus' most wonderful name. And God's people said, Amen. We pick up on verse 35. Jesus is here speaking to the believers, to the sheep, those who are standing on His right hand. And look at what we see. We see, number one, the last judgment will be a judgment according to evidence. The witnesses are not going to be brought forward anymore. The works of the one being judged will be. Now this is good news in one way and bad news in one way. It's good news because all those people that have lied about you and slandered you and hurt your family, they will be shut up on the last day. They will have nothing to say because they're going to be too busy worrying about what Jesus is going to say to them. That should be an encouragement to you if you've been slandered, if your name has been run in the mud. No, that no one's going to be able to accuse you on that day. They're not going to have anything to stand on on that day. It's just going to be Jesus Christ in you. And maybe that's the bad news, because you won't be able to fool God on that day if you think you're fooling Him right now. Now we see something else important in these verses. We will be held accountable on that day, not merely for what we said, but what we did, not merely for what we professed, but what we practiced. God is going to tear local churches in half on that day. Because there's a lot of people who attend buildings and they attend services that are called worship services. And they say the right things, but their lives have never done that. This is pretty sober, isn't it? On that day, all the accusers' mouths will be shut. On that day, all the pretentious talk, people raising their hands without raising their hearts will be stopped. On that day, people playing church instead of being the church will stop. Now, we need to make it very clear before we go any further. We read these verses, and some people have tried to say from these verses that doing good things is what gets you right with God. And we've all heard someone say, on the last day, God's going to have this beautiful scale, and He's going to put our good works on one side and our bad works on the other, and He's going to weigh them, and as long as the good works outweigh the bad... I'm okay with God. That's what religion says. 
That's what even some versions of Christianity claim. And I say versions, because it's not biblical Christianity. And so people are trusting in these things, and they use Matthew 25 as their proof for this view. But Jesus is very clear throughout the entire Gospels. James is very clear in chapter 2 of his book. Faith which has not works is dead being alone. These things we read here are the fruit of our salvation, not the root of our salvation. This kingdom is by inheritance, Matthew 25, 4. It was prepared for us by God before the foundation of the world. Prepared by God, not procured by men. So don't think today that if I just do A, B, C, D, and E, the things that are mentioned here, I'll be good with God. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. Ephesians 2 says it this way, By grace you were saved through faith, the heart. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, it's not of your works. It's not of feeding the poor or clothing the sick. Lest you should boast. We are His workmanship. He's the one who changes us. We don't change ourselves. What we read here is descriptive of God's child and their character. It serves as a testimony of what's inside of them. Here's the proof of that. Never once does Jesus command us to do these things. You can look high and low through the Bible, and Jesus Himself in the Gospels never says, do these things, and these things equal salvation. He does command us to repent. He does command us to be baptized. He commands us to make disciples. He commands us to love one another. He commands us to let our light shine. These things are expected that we read here. These are not commands that equal the Gospel. You got that much? So don't do that. Don't try to read this and justify yourself. Jesus is trying to unjustify you and make you realize you can't save yourself by these verses, not the other way around. All that said is introduction. Look what he begins in verse 35. He says to those on the right hand, to the believers, I was hungry and you gave me food, meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. In other words here, if you read the Gospels, there are four things you see Jesus do. And two of those are mentioned in these passages. Number one, what did Jesus do throughout the Gospels? He preached and he taught. He was unapologetic about what was right and what was wrong. And so Jesus spends a lot of time talking. Matthews 24 and 25, just one big message to His disciples, teaching them. But the second thing we see Jesus do is heal the sick. He cares about those whose health is bad. And the church should care about those whose health is bad as well. One of the most neglected people are the people that sit in nursing homes. People in hospitals. People that are shut in. Why don't people... Care about them, because they don't have the heart of Jesus. Because He did care about them. The third thing, He provided for those in need. It's not a social gospel to feed people. In fact, it's a loving part of the gospel to feed people. Because when we feed them food, we point them to the bread of life who will satisfy their hunger forever. So Jesus feeds people. And then fourthly, He spent time with people. And you can't do these things without spending time with people. You can't run a credit card and say, I've done Matthew 25. It doesn't work that way, does it? So realize, these are things Jesus did. These are things we should do if we possess His Spirit. So let's look at them. Number one, He provided food. To those who are hungry, you fed them. Believers should be doing this. It's expected of us. To a child whose parents don't have money, we should be willing to provide food. I heard about a church in town right now, a little church, country church, who every weekend when the kids go home from school on Friday, they provide a box lunch. Now, this is a little church smaller than ours, but they provide a box lunch that the kids can take home, and then on Saturday they have a meal to eat, and it's given for all the kids who are under the poverty level. And they give it freely. They don't even share the gospel with a track or something on the thing, because they wouldn't be allowed to do it at the school. All they do is consistently feed kids. But you know what? Every Sunday and the other six days of the week, Prayerfully, the people are living the gospel and proclaiming the gospel. And so, they get the food and the family says, These people care about me. These people are like Jesus. And then they want to hear the message that they're speaking because their kindness validates the love of God. So they feed them. To a neighbor who's lost their job, you feed them, you help them. To a person that's destitute sitting on the side of the road that no one cares about, you stop and you feed them. To a food bank that will get the food into the hands of someone in need. 
buying dinner for a church member in need, taking them out after a service, bringing dinner over to someone in need, frying a turkey for someone who can't afford one on Thanksgiving in just a few weeks, buying extra buy one, get one deals. I don't know if you've seen some of those deals in the grocery stores, but they're great. Balking up on these kind of things and taking advantage and then anonymously dropping off a bag of groceries at a family's house or an individual's house who doesn't have much of anything. But don't let them know you did it. Don't let your right hand know that your left hand was doing it. Keep it between you and God. And let God do something. Secondly, giving them a drink, a cup of cold water, helping someone who's who's thirsty. That's pretty self-explanatory. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Now, the strangers in Jesus' days were foreigners, travelers, someone who may not even know our own language, someone who's been so poor and traveling so long, they could die because they don't have enough food or clothing or friends. For some of us, our strangers are right next door to us. We don't even have to look hard for them. But there are strangers in Pensacola. There's people that don't speak like us, don't look like us, and they don't know the Jesus we know. Have you seen the Buddhists that are walking around Pensacola lately? The other day in Walmart, it was packed with Buddhists on 29. Those are strangers to America. They're not citizens, a lot of them. They don't know our language and they don't know the gospel. Who's going to show the love of Christ to them? Or are we going to stare and gawk at them because they have long robes on? What are we going to do? Well, this is what Jesus is talking about here. I was a stranger and you took me in, into your house. When was the last time you invited someone into your home? with hospitality and mercy. Spend time with them. You know, when was the last time you used your belongings for God? We can bring this into a 21st century idea here. Now, you can use your car for God. Give someone a ride that needs a ride. Bring someone to God's house. That would be a great idea, wouldn't it? How about have a home Bible study? I don't have to be the one that teaches it and comes to your house. I'd love to, but I know Brother Bill, Brother Greg would love to come. Start a home Bible study and bring strangers into your home and tell them about Jesus. That's a good idea, isn't it? Verse 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Now, we don't see a lot of people naked sitting on the side of the road anymore, thankfully. Right? But there's still an application here. Because there's a lot of kids who don't have clothing. You know, there is a kid that was living less than a block away from this church. Had one set of underwear and one set of clothes. And that's all they had. And they were going to school every day with the same stuff. And another church found out about it and went on Easter two years back and brought them a load of clothes to show the love of Christ. And then, because of that, this person got saved in the long run. And I was able to see that happen. Let me tell you something. Clothing someone may not seem like a big deal. To you, you may not care that some little girl or some little boy doesn't have a lot of clothes. But do you think they're going to care when they get warm clothes and get to wear them for the first time? Now look, we're not all rich in Pensacola, Florida. Have you looked at the economy lately? There are people who are in need. Now, it can go a little farther than that. You can recycle your old clothes. It sickens me when I walk up and down the road. I take walks every morning. And on trash day, you know, I walk up and down the road. And I don't know if it's because I'm nosy or what. Or it's because people have so much trash nowadays and they throw so much stuff out. But the cans are always cocked open like this, right? On like a 45 degree angle with all the junk on top. And I see good things thrown in the trash can. And it drives me crazy. And I'm not desperate enough to go in there and start taking them out yet. But there are homeless friends in this county. 1,600 at one time about a year ago. There's over 1,000 in Pensacola right now. Who don't have a shirt on their back. And instead of throwing them out. You could have took it and used it to help somebody. Goodness, give it to Goodwill or the Waterfront Mission before you throw it out. I mean, we are called to be good with the resources God has given us. How about taking clothes for a needy family at Christmas? Giving a a blanket to a needy family. If you can't put literal clothes on them, maybe they have clothes, so they're not naked in the literal sense, but you can pay a utility bill, a heating bill, buy someone an electric space heater. I mean, be practical here. You can help people because you should care about people suffering. You really should. James 2 says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed, what good is that? It's no good at all, is it? One of the biggest cop-outs is, I'll pray for you. I've heard a lot of Christians lie when they say those words. That means I'm not going to do anything for you. I'm sorry you're on hard times. Good luck. That's what it means, and that's sad. I'll pray for you is a cop-out. 
If you're not willing to step up and do something about it. Willing to be the answer to the prayer. Look at the last one. I was in prison. I was sick. You visited me. People are in prison, in the jails, in Pensacola. And what's sad is that there are not enough gospel preaching people going down and visiting them. And caring about them. And I can tell you, people's lives do get changed in prison. Some are in prison for doing the right thing. Some are in prison for doing the wrong thing. But it doesn't matter. We are called to check on them. We are called to pray for them and care about them. Hebrews 13 says, Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, as those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Look at the last one. I was sick and you visited me. Came to their bedside while they were sick. We should visit them, help them, give them a listening ear, be willing to do stuff for people that can't do it for themselves because of their physical condition. You know, nothing makes me happier than when I hear a church member went and cut another church member's grass. Or their neighbor's grass. Or brought a meal over to them when they were sick. Or just called them on the phone and prayed with them and encouraged them. These are things Christians do. Not because we're commanded to do it. Because it's what we want to do. Because we're changed by Jesus Christ. Now why are all these things mentioned here? Why does Jesus mention these things by name? He could have said a lot of other stuff. Well he said it because these are things that every child of God can do. Not every child of God is called to preach. And thank God for that. Not every child of God has the gift of giving. And thank God for that. Not every child of God has the gift of mercy. Thank God for that. But every child of God can do these things. The early church father Christostom said this about this passage. Jesus said not, I was sick and you healed me. Or I was in prison and you set me free, but you visited me and you came unto me. These are small, realistic things that everyone in the body of Christ can do and should do. And the reason why the gospel is not seen in the church is because we don't live the gospel during the week. That's why. I don't care. I I heard a, a pastor talking, rightly so, about Mormons who keep coming to his house. And they keep knocking on the door. And he's even got a no soliciting sign. And they keep coming week after week. And he said, this is the thing that really irritates me about them. I ask them all the same question. And you know what? They all have the same answer. It's a canned answer. It's not a biblical answer. It's not a compassionate answer. It's not a caring answer. It's the same trained, I'm following my sales pitch routine answer. And he asks them every time, it's great that you come here and you're wearing a tie and that you look the part of a Mormon. But let me ask you this question. How do I know you're legit? Instead of spending years of your life walking around, knocking on doors, telling people about the Mormon church, why don't you live like Jesus did? Because Jesus didn't just knock on doors. He said, why don't you do something to help somebody in the community? And then we can talk about what you believe. And the guy said to him, I never thought of that before. This is all we're trained to do is to walk around and talk. And you know what? This is the sad thing. That's what most Christians do. Born again Christians, they walk around and they talk. They may even wear a Christian t-shirt or have a lame Christian bumper sticker. But they don't live any of it. And this is the problem of Christianity today. I see churches, you know, I get angry. I see signs on churches that say, Revival. And I hear Christians boasting about the attendance in their services and the size of the choir when the basic duties of the faith are neglected. That's why the church has no power. All of that stuff, the size of your choir, and having a big sign that says revival is wood, hay, and stubble. Who are you to think you can cause revival? Only God can bring revival down. Who are you to think that the size of your choir means you're doing what Jesus wants us to do? Jesus doesn't say here, Come, those of you who are blessed with my Father, prepared for the foundation of the world. You have a wonderful choir. Or you have a wonderful preacher. I'll get personal about myself. He says, you are doing what you said. You are doing what you said. One of the things that is often heard on television is the doctrine of fasting. Abstaining from food. Now, I believe in fasting. It's biblical. I think we should do it. Fasting is a way to abstain from food and to seek God. And to seek His immediate help. To seek His powerful hand in our lives. And I don't want to preach on fasting today. But there is one Bible passage that really describes fasting. 
I mean, the Old Testament says it's a time to afflict our souls and things of this nature. But Isaiah 58 is the only passage that really details fasting. And you know what it says, the point of fasting is? It says there, why we should fast. Is it not, Isaiah 58, 7, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? And when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? In other words, fasting is supposed to make us live for Jesus. It's supposed to make us realize that the basic things of life matter to God. If He will provide for the sparrow in the field, He expects that we will trust in Him, that He will provide for us too. And then He wants to use us to provide for others. That's what love is. You know, the Pharisees were a theological bunch. They had the answers. They knew their theology. But you know what? Jesus said to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And you know what? We need to become people of mercy again. Instead of all talk, we need to be walk and talk. We need to be the people of mercy whose hearts hurt like God's heart hurts. And that care like God cares. He says, cast all your cares upon me for I care for you. That's His heart. Now do you all agree we are supposed to have God's heart in this world? Then we need to start caring like God cares. Yes, we want to see people saved. In fact, that should be our number one goal to make disciples. But making a disciple isn't just seeing someone get saved. It's helping the whole person. Body, soul, and spirit. Helping them the whole way. I'm not going to finish the sermon today. We're just going to talk about the righteous today. Look at the next three verses. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed thee, thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come unto you? The reason why these people do these things is because of what verse 37 says. The righteous say. Now, they weren't made righteous because they did these things. They were made righteous because of Jesus Christ. Understand this. Righteous means right with God. And you can't make yourself right with God. You can't live a perfect life. You can't do all these things in Matthew 25. It's not possible. But you know what? Jesus came and lived the perfect life we could never live. He died the perfect death we could never die. He rose again, and now He puts His righteousness, His rightness on us. And now we can live these things. Now we can do these things. So the righteous can do all things through Christ who gives Him strength. Not because you're strong or you're righteous, because He's righteous. And He makes you righteous. So now that you've been changed by Jesus, and you've been made righteous, and your light's starting to shine, you're going to do all these things, and one day you're going to stand before Him, and you're going to answer Jesus. Now this is not some cocky answer. For a lot of cocky Baptists, some proud Baptists out there. Well, you're ashamed to the faith if you're cocky and proud, let me tell you. This is a statement of humility, indicative of of deep unworthiness. Look what they say. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed thee, thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and take you in? When when did we ever see you naked and clothe you? Or see you sick or in prison and come unto you? In other words, they are going to be clothed with humility, like 1 Peter says. They are not going to be like the Pharisees who say, Oh God, thank you, I'm not like those filthy sinners over there. I fast twice a week and I give my tithes of all that I get in. No, no. This is going to be a day of great humility on the final day of judgment. A great day of thanksgiving. And they are going to be stunned. When did we see you? We could say that today. In 2011, Jesus is not bodily here on the earth. Elijah can say the same thing. When did I see you? He didn't bodily see Jesus Christ on earth. You know, this shows us something here. It shows us, number one, that believers in heaven have put no confidence in their works. They don't think it was their works that got them there. They know it was the blood of Jesus alone that justified them, that made them right. And I love this second part about what this says. This says, the fact that they are thoroughly unaware of having ever performed any good deeds for Jesus is exactly what makes these deeds good. You get that? If they knew they were doing good, if they were trying to be good just to be good for good's sake, it wouldn't have been good. It would have been selfishly motivated, tainted with sin. They didn't know. They were unaware of what they were doing was being done to Jesus. And that's what makes it good. You know, a lot of us love to pat ourselves on the back when we should be lifting up Jesus Christ above our heads. 
Because if we lift Him up, He will draw people unto Himself. Spurgeon says it this way here, They fed the hungry, they clothed the naked, they visited the sick for Christ's sake, because it was the sweetest thing in the world to do anything for Jesus. They did it because they delighted to do it. Because they could not help doing it. It was their new nature impelling them to do it. In other words, we read this and we see it was the simple response of love from the heart. It's what people that have experienced God's love do. In other words, you don't have to plan this out. You just do it because it's what God wants you to do. And Jesus says here, If you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. I love this. The person who is looked down in the church, the person who is pushed to the back, the person who is ignored in the church. You know how some churches do that very unbiblical thing where they vote on deacons and it's a great popularity contest? And they all vote, and when they vote, they're voting the guy who's popular in the church to be the deacon, not the guy who meets the qualifications in the Bible. And then the guy who is very biblical and godly is pushed to the back and ignored in carnal churches. Well, on that day, none of that will be going on anymore. The least of these, the most ignored brother, the one who didn't have all the money, the one who didn't, like a Baptist church I preached in once for a few weeks, there was a guy there who definitely was the wealthiest guy in the church, and he had this hot sports car, and every Sunday he parked it right at the front of the driveway. He made his own parking spot. So everyone saw this guy's car when he walked in. And he was the talk of the church. And people thought he was great. And on that day, Jesus is not talking about him. He's talking about the least of these. The ones we consider the dogs of the flock. And Jesus identifies them with himself. They're my brothers. They're my sisters. They're my family. He said this earlier in Matthew 12. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. You think blood is thicker than water? Well, Jesus' blood is thicker than any family relation on this earth. We are the family of God. His blood is greater and brings us closer together. And if you did it unto one of them, you did it to me. And let me tell you, Christians are poor. Christians can be homeless people. I was talking to Brother Greg Ferguson. He's working on a sermon. And he was studying. I'm not going to steal his thunder. But he was studying where Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said, I read that and it came to me, Jesus is the King of the homeless. And let me tell you something, there are Christians who don't have any of these things. And they love God, but they're on hard times. Paul, the Apostle, the greatest, in many of our eyes. What does he say in 1 Corinthians 4? To the present hour, we hunger, we thirst, we are poorly dressed, we are buffeted, we are homeless. 1 Corinthians 4.11 Jesus considers, if you do it to them, you've done it to me. He identifies with the church. He loves the church. They are His people. They are His loved ones. I need to close this out, so let me just give you two illustrations. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. Don't necessarily agree with all of his doctrine, but the guy was saved and he did a great work in his day. The last speech before he died on this earth, standing before the entire Salvation Army that God had built up into this relief organization and gospel organization in England and India and here in America and there was even in a few other countries by the time he died. This is what he said. He said, while women weep as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry, I'll fight. While men go to prison in and out and in and out as they do now, I'll fight. While there is a drunkard left, while there is a poor, lost girl upon the streets, where there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. I'll fight to the end. That needs to be the call of the church again. We care. Jesus loves you and so do we. And we can't die on the cross for you. Jesus did that. But we can love you in other ways. And we're going to show it. And that's what God's going to be pleased with on the last day. It's great to talk about Jesus feeding the multitudes, loaves and fishes. But it will not do any good while people in this neighborhood, in your neighborhood, are perishing through the lack of food and ability to be helped. Because no one cares. It's great to talk about the feeding of the 5,000. It's better to show how Jesus still feeds people today and loves people today. I think of D.L. Moody. One of my heroes founded the most successful Sunday school programs ever in the world. Back in the 19th century, working in northern Chicago in the district known as Little Hell. Imagine working in a place called Little Hell and you think your children's ministry is wild. 
The building he rented to teach the children was a broken down saloon surrounded by 200 bars and gambling dens. It was a lot different than today in the culture there. The area was inhabited by the darkest and most dangerous of Chicago. And the children that lived there were the poorest of the poor with parents that were either alcoholics or drug abusers. So how did Moody attract so many children to leave such a rough environment and come sing church songs and learn Bible stories and study the Bible? He did it because he loved them. With genuine, compassionate love. He would give them oranges and peanuts and candies that he carried in his pockets. He couldn't die on a cross for them, but he could love them like the one who died on the cross did. And then... He would bring a pony to downtown Little Hell in Chicago. And he would bring this pony and give the kids pony rides just to let them know that he cared about them and Jesus cared about them. And after looking after them, he would visit their homes if they were absent. Never looked down on any of them. Never stuck his nose up when he walked in their dilapidated, beat-up, rotten, cockroach-filled homes. One of Moody's employers said that Moody was so generous financially that one day alone he went into the store and bought 20 pairs of shoes because God put it on his heart to do it. And he went and he put 20 pairs of shoes on kids' feet that day because they were barefoot. If Moody discovered that a child's parents were in great nude, he would make a basket with fruit, coal to heat the house, blankets, other necessities, personally drop it off at the home and leave before they knew who did it. D.L. Moody said this, and this is where I'm going to end today. The reason so many preachers, and I will add, so many churches have failed, is because love has not been the motive power. A man, a woman, though deep in learning, though deep in theology, if they have not love in their heart, they will not do any good. The poor, lost world has swung out into the cold and the dark and doesn't know anything about the love of God. And if we do not love men with the same kind of love that Jesus had for this lost world, we are not going to reach them. There is no way to preach love like living it in our actions. I have to end today, and I want to end with this thought. God's love was infinite love. Powerful love. Saving eternal love. Suffering the wrath of God and hell on the cross so we could be forgiven. We can't duplicate that. That's once for all. But because He's loved us, we can love one another. And we can show this world that love is not a theory. Love is not just a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. Love is real today. And you better believe We are going to be called to account on our actions on the final day of judgment. Did we love like Jesus loved? If you are not a believer today, the Bible says God demonstrated His love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us. If you haven't had someone love on you, I'm sorry. But God's ready to love you today. God's ready to change you today. If you will call upon Him and receive Him and turn from your sins and follow Him. All this love here about food and clothing, that's nothing compared to the love of God, which will fill your heart and change your life. He died and He rose again, so your life could be changed. Would we bow our heads in prayer before the Lord today? If you are not a Christian and you don't know Jesus today, today you need to call on Him and ask His love to come into your heart. His love to change your life. You need to pray and ask Him to receive you. And to do what you cannot do. Make you His child. And forgive you. And take you to heaven one day. To be with you forever. If you're not a Christian today, you need to pray right now. Pray from the depths of your heart and ask Him to save you. If you're a believer today who has lost sight of the love of God, who has lost sight, you need to recommit today. You need to ask God to recharge the love that's in there, to to get the world out of your heart and fill your heart back up with His love, and to be faithful in the small things to the least of these. Because if you're faithful in little, much will be given. And He will do wonderful things. Let's silently pray to our Lord in the next moments. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. 
And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.